Yes, sir. <laughs> are we recording now? We are. Welcome it's to the good. show. My name is Tom Wise. Yes, and I'm Melinda McKenzie, and you are unpacking some shit with us today. Today is Monday. I'm quite certain of that. It feels like a Monday now. <laughs> so, um, Tom, your family's been in town. What's that like? It's been a nightmare, especially my sister. Oh, no. <laughs> And my brother. How are you? I can't so get nice rid of him. See you guys. Look and at all of you. Hey, Mel. How you doing, darling? We're hanging out. We're yeah. big fans, just so you yeah. know. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've seen you. You have uh, showed up on my Facebook as someone you might know, oh. and you're blonde in that picture. You She's know, different. I can't make up my mind about my hair. It could I, be great. I'm the same. <laughs> Have you met my sister Mary? This is Mary. Hi. It's so nice to see you. This is Mimi. This is Johnny's wife. I'm not the oldest. I'm the oldest. Oldest. I'm, the oldest. Oldest. I'm for one. Yeah, come on You're in. one. I know you inside out. I know. You're one. But it, it's some, and here's Jessica, one of the children. Here's Jessica. Hi. They're it's New Yorkers. Good to see you. Melinda lives a mere three, four blocks away from me. Wow. Yeah, I live very close. Do you yeah. see her often? Probably not. Um, I mean, in the last year, I've seen no one. <laughs> so, isn't it fun? We're all together okay. right now. Okay, okay we got to go. Oh, nice. Tom put a lot of, nice you you a lot of press on us to just come in and get out. This is <laughs> if this is an international podcast. Okay. <laughs> nice to going. see you, Melinda. Bye. Don't let the door hit the ass on the way out. How lovely! That was so nice. How nice. Thank you, Mary. So nice of them. It's crazy because it all started with Jimmy just coming down on a you know boys' weekend, and then everybody just said they're all retired. I'm out, I'm out. Let's go. Oh my gosh. And did the weather cooperate with you this weekend? Yes, no rain yesterday. It was overcast for the horse races. And then okay. it, I mean it was it's it should be raining now, according to the forecast. And it's over wow. and it's it's gray, but it's nice. Everybody's outside, you know, we're relaxed. It's great. Good. Did you win any money at the races? I am so again conservative. It's crazy how my brain works. When it comes to business, yeah, it's, we got to put eighty-seven grand into this thing, and hopefully we get some money out. I mean, that's how business is. Here, I'm squeezing two dollars. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm so nervous. <laughs> In the meantime, you're picking up the tab for this and spending the money right. for that. It's just crazy. Right. So I don't, I don't like losing. So I bet everything to show, like a, you know. Uh. Okay. But I but I uh, yesterday I bet only names. I I usually take out the pencil and do the analysis. Did you ever are you oh. familiar with handicapping a race? Like you try to come a up bit, with a reason a why. Bit, yes. I was everything was a name yesterday. I won, I think, four out of seven, six races. I was in the money. Well, that's good. And you just went based on their name. <laughs> just on their name. I love that. Yeah, it was great. Good. Well, very good. Um, I'm no glad. No big to winners, hear it. no big losers. Well, I know that the world's starting to wake up and come back, you know, in different areas. So it's been interesting to watch, you know, from where I'm at. Everybody's so. vaccinated. They're all from yeah. Chicago and the likes. They're all vaccinated. It's vaccinated yeah. in Orlando. So yeah, it's as good as it's going to be, right? Yep. Yep. No, I hear you. I hear you. So on this beautiful Monday in April, I believe it's the 19th. Yes. Um, what's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? I had an, I thought was an interesting question or topic yes okay and then we could i know that you've got a lot but i, I know this sure. is gonna be a short show as you're busy with making money <laughs> takes takes over the conversation but how about this here's the question if you could choose are you happy with where you were born and the year you were born and if you could choose another both and both what would you because I was thinking, because I'm thinking family with my family here, right? This weekend. Yes. I said, I've always been kind of, for no reason, you're either prideful or regretful or embarrassed of where you were born. And maybe yeah. you wish you were born a little bit earlier or a little bit later. I mean, it's always been nice. To, I'm born in Chicago. It's an international world type city. People, oh yeah, I was born in the city, not in some crazy suburb. I had nothing to do with that. Right? right. But there's pride in being born in Chicago because you get some suburbans going, oh, I'm from Chicago. No, you're really from Lake Zurich. It's not Chicago. Yeah, you're right. And then I always thought, you know, 1958 is kind of an interesting year to be born. I thought 
I would like to be maybe a little bit older during the 60s because I would enjoy the hippies, the Beatles, or, you know, instead I'm six, seven, eight years old during all that stuff. But it was interesting. I, I, uh, but I liked, I was glad I, I lived through that era and was aware of that era. But then I said that then the thought is, what if you could pick another place? What if you could be born in, you know, Paris in 19, yeah. you know, 75? Who knows what? Ooh, I love you know, Yeah, I love this question because I I guess you I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, Tom. So I was born in Frankfurt, Indiana. And I've always huh, the question been, Yeah. I've always been embarrassed by it. So when people ask me, I say Frankfurt and I hope that they think it's Germany. <laughs> I've done it my whole life. I, I played basketball for Northeastern and people think it's Boston. No, Northeastern College in Chicago. Yes. Um, and I'll tell you why, because I know my Hoosier people are going to be upset. But, you know, this is my opinion. I have always found Indiana to be more narrow minded than what I'm comfortable with. If somebody put a gun to my head and said, where was Melinda born? I would say in Hawaii. Yes, right. I try to not share that I was born in Indiana because I don't want people to think, not that wherever you're born determines your mindset, but my whole life I've, oh, I'm born in Frankfurt. I changed the subject. <laughs> I, oh. I wish I was born internationally. I think it'd be more exotic yeah. and more interesting, even if you didn't live a life there. You know, I, but the era, I love that question. I've never right. thought while you were talking, I started thinking, well, I wouldn't have minded being a rebel during the 50s. I liked the, uh, some of the interesting things that were going on in the 50s and 60s. I, I love 50s music and I love like the whole saw cop, uh, the roller skates at the, at the drive in, you know, I love all that, but I would have loved to have been like a rebel and a feminist during those times, right. fighting the man and all that stuff. Burning your bra. <laughs> I, I've never thought deeply about it, but I think that's a fascinating, that's a good party question, right? It, it's a good party question, but I always felt badly for my children. Oh, they're born in Florida. Ugh. You know, I'm born in Chicago. My yeah. wife was born in, you know, Los Angeles, California. It's like, oh, these are great, two yeah. great cities to be from. Instead, the kids are born in Florida. But see, look how you say it, though. You but say they, they're fine with it. But Florida is a state. Right. And, and you're mentioning the city you were born in. You don't say Illinois. No, I don't. But I mean, even they were born in Bel Air Beach, which is. That sounds nice. That sounds nice. And the other one was, I think I was. Uh, yeah, they were Bel Air Beach for all of them. That sounds lovely. That sounds, sounds rich. lovely. Well, it's funny because my youngest sister was born in Hawaii, but we moved when she was a small baby. She's and she Hawaii. loves telling people. She was born in Hawaii. And when I was talking to my mom about going back to visit, I said, you know, I want to go back, mom, go to the old neighborhood. She's like, oh, Kelly wants to go. I'm like, she has zero memories. She was a baby. What? But I get it. I would like to brag about being born in Hawaii. Uh, so. And, 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 it's, and it, it's interesting. So it's pridefulness or sadness over something or you have, you no have nothing to do about it. No control. no control. Well, I will tell you, my anxiety comes from people thinking that I spent my whole life there and that I what I'm a ultra conservative, narrow minded, whites only wow. kind of thing. I'm telling you, that is Indiana. I mean, it, it still is. I, I know there's progressive areas, of course, but you know, I saw family there and I talked to people on a regular basis. Of, here's a fine example in the school system where someone I know works with everything that's happening in the world, there has been no mandate coming down about teaching about uh, what's happening in the world with all the shootings, right? There's no, they don't discuss it. It's not talked about. It's, it's a big Trump. There's a lot of Trump conservative and I'm not saying they don't they can't choose that they can but there's not a lot of balance and so this person was saying I don't know what to do because there's no mandate coming down saying we should discuss this because this person says most of my students are black and there's no discussion on what's happening in the world right now and that's Indiana they're very conservative they're run by a lot of people that don't want to do that you know I wanted to talk to our guest Greg about his philosophy with the police, I, but I didn't want to put him on a, on the spot for something, because that's going to be a very 
yeah. you know, as a, as a, as a mayor, you better have a philosophy that, you know, that, yeah. that people are buying into. Well, when he gets closer to the election, we should probably bring him back and, and talk some more because we didn't get, we were so busy just trying to let people discover who he was. We didn't have a lot of time asking him, you know, those questions. And right. I think that'd be fascinating. Right. I mean, I, I would like to do that. Um, I have a lot of topics. Um, let's do it. Okay. So we can talk about NASA. We can talk about Pepsi. We can talk about the weekend shootings. There's a lot of gun wow. stuff going on. We can talk about a sex drive, the CDC travel information, or reparations for what's happening in Manhattan Beach where property is given back to a family that was taken away from them and it's worth $75 million. Well, Manhattan Beach is the highest, is the most expensive place in the country, isn't it? Um, I don't know, but it, I'm sure... I'm sure that it's up there. Um, you know, people people talk about reparations and I think there's a lot of, just like defunding the police, there's a lot of misunderstanding of like, I support defunding the police, not to get rid of the police, but to get social workers and other people that know how to work with uh, mental health, right? I'm not saying not have police. I'm no, saying- No, nobody says that. Yeah, Nobody. but I think there's a confusion about defunding the plea, and and that's not at all what I mean. And reparations, I think, get gets a bad play because people are like, we're just gonna give stuff away. Well, from my understanding, just like this particular case here, is that this property belonged to this family, and it was just simply taken from them. Like I think they said they were given like uh, twelve hundred dollars for it, and they didn't want to sell it. And they're like, what, we're what year was this? Um, I knew you were going to. I'm not ask. familiar. With, I'm not familiar with the, the, the this this uh, case. Uh, 1924. So 24. Uh -huh. Um, it said that um this family owns several luxurious beachfront properties in in uh Manhattan Beach in the 20s. Um, but due to racial segregation and harassment from white neighbors and the KKK, the city took the property away through eminent domain in 1924. Right. Okay. okay. I was going to say so, probably eminent domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this is Los Angeles uh, County. So uh, the family name is the Bruce's. So, you know, they had, they had it taken away from them. They were given, this is Manhattan beach waterfront property. So they already owned it. It was theirs. They were uh, given... Sorry, I want to make sure I read this right. It was purchased for $1,225, and today it's worth $75 million. Um, it says that there is a bill scheduled to be introduced to state legislators to allow the county to transfer the land back to the Bruce family. Um, Governor Gavin Newsom is expected to sign the bill into law without much pushback, and that is expected to end by uh, uh, 2021. May I ask a question? Yeah, I don't. Uh, do you know what the so the government never did anything with the property? They never developed it for anything for for social good. Yeah, that's what that was part of the problem. Okay, so they just there. they got it, but they didn't put a bus station there or some homeless shelter. They just they just grabbed the property. Yes. In yeah, and then they probably paid at that time was probably fa fair value. At the time in nineteen twenty four, I'm sure. So, but they didn't want to sell it. They were. They, they, there was some sort of controversy. Oh, that's yeah. Interesting. And so they didn't. And, you know, I don't know a lot about eminent domain. I know the smallest, smallest amount. And my understanding is that the government could just come take something if there's something that the government decides has more value than what you're doing. We're putting in a road. We're putting in a road and you're a farm and the road is going to be, you know, I-75 and we can't just stop and take the, to make the road go around your property. We need to buy this in these 23 acres and because right. we're putting in a road. So because right. you know, that's the usually something like that. Yeah. And the government is supposed to pay for fair market value, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. It's not okay. like we're going to get and pay you nothing. And then okay. it's, it's always, you know, I've never done it, but that's what I heard. People always, oh, I didn't get enough. Well, whatever. But but the government the government has to have that power because they can't you can't just stop every project around everybody's piece of private property and it's probably no good and people don't want to do it but for the good of the people we're good we're building we're building highways in chicago you got to have access to property that makes sense yeah and so i guess my question would be who decides what's for the good of the people 
I mean, I'm sure there's always going to be good and bad to that, right? Oh, like, there's no doubt about it. And then, you know, because the government has such a shitty track record of doing bad, shady stuff. I mean, but clearly the government, having a government is a good idea. We I, want police, we want army, we want libraries, we want schools. So we like the, the yeah. idea of it. But then the people can be, oh, oh, we know this train's going in here. So let's buy some property you know, where the train's yeah. going to be going so we can buy it for a dollar and sell it for $50, you know? So, sure. so you always have that shadiness going on. But so at some yeah. point you just hope that the government is doing what's good for everybody. And, you know, yeah. 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 I mean, but if, if, but they haven't done anything in Manhattan beach, then they should be able to get the property back. Yeah. So I'm very excited for this family. Imagine, right. If that was your family legacy and then suddenly here it is 2021 and they're like, you get back your $75 million property. How fantastic is that? So hopefully that'll open a door to maybe other things that have just been languishing and haven't been taken care of. That would be, that would be lovely. Be interesting to do the math on what 1200 bucks was worth back then versus interest payments, whatever that would be worth today. Probably not 75 million. Probably not, probably not. And I, I don't know how that works, but I'm excited that at least something good is coming out. Yeah, of it, every right? now and again, the government says, yeah, we screwed up here. So it's, yeah. it's good for everybody, even though we're, we, it doesn't affect you or me, but it's nice to know the government every it's now and right. says, hey, something's wrong. But unfortunately, there's probably a lot of money involved to get this thing through. Yeah. And there's again, there's a 75 you know, million payday at the end of it. Yeah. Again, I don't know. How are you feeling about this week? They're saying this week closing arguments are going to happen during for this trial. This I can never say is Derek. What's his last name? Sh Siobhan? Chauvin. Chauvin. Yeah. Yeah. What, how are you feeling about that? What What are your expectations? I think that I think they're closing. Uh, they're they're closing arguments today. I think. Oh, is it okay? They and expect to give it to a, the jury. A sense or a feel based on what you've seen or what people are saying, how you think it's going to go, or what you think you know will be the end result on this. I have been I have been watching not religiously, but I've I've watched you know chunks, hour chunks, yeah. and and compressed testimony of the case. I mean. I don't think anybody can see this thing and say, well, he really did. We watched the guy kill somebody. So, yeah, I mean, my heart is like, you know, throw away the key. Um, and I think, I, I think this is very good for the government to go nice and slow. It's always try to get the emotion out of it. Try to just be very scientific about it. I think he's going to be found guilty, but if he's not found guilty, I mean, all they need is one, one person to have a question. And the defense did put up a guy saying, you know, this is carbon monoxide. Um, this is, you know, whatever. I mean, contradicting everything that the prosecution said. Uh, I don't think it was that convincing, but you never know. I mean, they that found OJ. OJ was not guilty. I know. It's the whole reasonable doubt. And if you've ever, you've been on a jury before, right? Yeah, I never goes. I never tried a case. I've been selected, oh. but never went through it. No. I've only been on one jury. And the hardest thing about being on that jury was you had to take every emotion out. And and it's hard because in real life, we don't do that. No, we, we're so, able to, you know, yeah, you're able to shoot from the hip because you don't have any responsibility. It'd be like, as much as I don't like Trump, you know, I don't like Trump. Okay. If I would see him on the street, there'd be a, a, a gravitas because he was the president. I'd have a respect for the position and it would be okay. like, I would, I would have a hard time going up and him saying, you know, you're a real jackass because he's the president. So when you're, you know, when in that moment, I might feel differently than I feel when I'm on the computer, you know, that orange Cheeto, blah, blah, blah. But if you'd meet him in person, there'd be, there's an effect, just like when you're, you're on, on the jury you know, oh, he's guilty. Throw that, you know, Nazi away. No, I'm one of 12 people and I really have to take this seriously. So. Yeah. It's, you know, it's very like, heavy. We, yeah. we were in a case where a teacher was uh, suspected of uh, improper behavior with a female student. And when we were debating, it was a two day trial. When we were debating, this is, this is what broke my heart. Cause you, you're supposed to have a jury of your peers. I don't think you ever really do. It's really a manipulation of what either side thinks will work for them, right? Right. And well, they're I, citizens. I didn't think I would get chosen. The uh, defense didn't want me, but the prosecutor, the prosecution wanted me because I had daughters, right? I was a mom of daughters, and this was a, a female that had said she had been, you know, inappropriately handled. When we went the first day of deliberations, a man on the jury said, 
I want to wrap this up. I have tickets to a hockey game tonight. And can I just tell you, as someone who I felt the weight of we, this man's life was in our hands. Was he going to go to prison or not? As soon as that man said that, I thought I'll do everything in my power to make everybody stay because now you have a fight on your hands. You have to fucking think about what you're doing. I'm not going to do this. And this is this man's life. And you want to go to a hockey game? I was, I lost my mind. Um, so yes, uh, I can imagine what those jurors are going through because I'm going to guess they're going to be haunted no matter what they choose. Don't you think people are going to follow them and want to, you know, harass them? And don't you think, I think they're going to get, I feel bad for them. I think that it's a, this will follow them forever. It's, it's interesting because, you know, I listen to the different podcasts and I listen to a guy, my guy Corolla is like, He's, he's like, he's selling the idea that the, that the cops being railroaded and we're pushing through justice. Like, wow, that's a very hard position to be on. What, why does he feel it? Well, I mean, just, well, it's, you know, that this, these, this trial is anti-cop. It's like, not really. We're anti-bad people. Anti-murder. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of, I'm kind of against murdering a guy. So, okay. so, so that, so that, that those folks are lining up, you know, black, you know, the blue line and all this other stuff. It's like, yeah i just want you know we just want people to stop killing people over traffic incidents that's all we want it's not a big it's not a big ask i don't think that's a big ask i think no. that's reasonable no it's not yeah. it's like and, and, I, and i get it like they shot well, i don't want to talk let's not talk about all that stuff okay so i just think it's interesting it's it's historical so when we look back on yeah. this it's really interesting because there are many different sides to i think he gets scenario. found guilty what, what do you think i you know what i, I tried to watch it i'm concerned that they're going to find a reasonable doubt. I'm concerned. I think he's guilty just based on what I've seen and knowing his history, which I know the jury's not allowed to know the police officer's history. I think that's relevant, but who am I? I'm concerned either way that it goes, we're going to have um, unrest. I, I think either way, right? If he's found guilty, I think the white supremacists are going to lose their minds and we're going to have some shit go down. I think if he's found, I'm sorry, if he's found guilty, the- uh, Yeah, you know, white I, supremacists. Yeah, the white supremacists. If he's found innocent- Or not guilty. Or not guilty. not Just not guilty. Not necessarily innocent. Not no, one's ever, no one's ever found innocent. You're right. I'm sorry. Not guilty. Not guilty. Um because of a technicality or what, you know, we have laws and guidelines for a reason. Yeah. I am very concerned about the unrest with that as well, because I think that the people that are fighting for the rights of people that are getting killed lately are going to take it very personally, right? Because it's going to represent a lot of things that's happening in the world is, is what I think. Okay. So um, do you want, let's talk about sex drive. Please. Let's, Let's talk, talk about, about sex, baby. Sex guy. So I did pull this up on my phone because there was so much information. I was like, oh, I can't even um, digest all of this. Hey, speaking of that, I, I'm enjoying an interesting podcast. If you like comedy, let's yeah. talk about sets, S-E-T-S. They're not doing the show anymore, but I've, they've done it, they did it for like two years and, oh. and 50, 60 episodes. Very interesting about dissecting a comedic brain and, you know. Oh, I love it. Tips and how to write material and that's all sorts right. of stuff. Uh-uh. Oh, that's so nice. I like to talk right. about sets. I'll, I'll definitely look that up. So I think you're going to enjoy this first uh, statement here. I was just, I thought, you know, I want to look up sex drives. Let's talk about like, obviously we know men and women are different, but then let's really dig into like personally what works for us, right? Because everybody's sex drive is different, but you have the whole idea about men have a very strong sex drive and, you know, women's sex drive takes longer. It's an, it, it comes about in different ways. <laughs> You're going to love this. The sex drive refers to a hypothetical construct encompassing one's attitude towards sex. Okay. It says sexual desires and sexual behaviors. Men have a stronger sex drive than women. And this gender difference is evident in cross cultural research involving men and women from 53 different countries. Now, this is what I find interesting because, you know, we live in the United States. We, oh, I only know how men in the United States. What's going on in Denmark? I mean, I would, my idea is that they're more liberal with sex and they're more open with partners is Nairobi. my idea, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it says, um, 
women's sex drive, this is over all 53 countries, is more bearable across women than, um, hold on, I'm going to, I'm trying to narrow this down because it's a lot. It says, okay, our sex drive, female sex drive is influenced by the menstrual, menstrual cycle as well as their desire for their partners or alternative partners. So I didn't know, did you know that? That it was influenced by our menstrual, menstrual cycle? Well, I thought that, I thought don't women when they're fertile desire sex more than when they're not? Biologically we do, like emotionally we don't, but biologically it's like our bodies are screaming for it, right? Kind of like with guys' testosterone, right? Exactly. Yeah, which I which I I thought was fascinating. Um, but they also talk about um, the men, the men's sex drive is not only consistently higher than the woman's, but it's more consistent over time. And this is what causes the uh, the the clash and the issue of like you know men wanting more sex because not only do you have a higher drive, it's more consistent, and ours is like up and down and wavy and, and all this stuff. So my question to you, Tom, is with your relationships, have you found a connector in that you feel like as a man, it's always up to you to pursue sex because of your drive? Or do you feel like women in all your relationships have been just as equal in pursuing you sexually in a relationship? Generally, I think that that's an, that's a it's it's kind of like the man initiates, but you get tired of initiating all the time, especially okay. if when you initiate, you get rejected or like not tonight, whatever, whatever. So that gets weary. So it's nice when the woman initiates. I I think it's a good idea for women to I know all things let's say all things being equal we're not right. mad we're not this we're right, this right, just right. a standard flat relationship that a woman should like because this is an interest this is a conversation that a lot of men have okay and the conversation is you want me to be faithful to you I'm committing we're talking about a marriage or let's a committed relationship sure. I'm committing myself and I'm I'm telling you I'm going to be faithful to you yes right your half of that equation means you need to be interested and make yourself available, even if you don't really feel it or want it or whatever, because I've got nowhere else to go. I've got no other way that I can legitimately, you know, pursue this sexual desire, except for you. I promise that I'm going to be faithful to you. And if you decide, yeah, I'm mad, don't want it, don't do it. It's like, I got nowhere to go, but to cheat on our relationship, especially if it goes on months and months or weeks and weeks or whatever it's going to be. So I think a woman needs to say my part of that agreement when he's going to tell me he's going to be faithful is I need to be 98% available. And again, we're not talking about an abusive situation. We're talking about just the regular relationship. It's a Tuesday. We're in bed. It's 930. He'd like to get it on. You'd like to go to sleep. I, I hear what you're saying. And, and I mean, I, I pretty much agree with you. I think sex is really important. And I think we're not, I, I want to be clear. We're not condoning cheating if someone's struggling in the bedroom. Of course not. We're talking about, but right. this this is where this this is where the road starts drifting in that direction. Yeah. You know, she's saying no to me. It's month four. It's like, what have I gotten into? I've got kids, and I don't want to destroy our marriage, but I would like to have sex. I'd right. like to have sex with her. She's saying no because she's whatever. Right. And and you know, along those same lines, because I, I do, I think it's important, and I think because you guys have agreed to be intimate with each other. If you're not sharing it with each other, human beings are bound to start looking other places. It doesn't make it right, but that's no. just human nature and what's going to happen. And I think what makes it interesting, Tom, is because we women need so much up here in order to really get our libido going, I think the same thing needs to be said when it comes to women making themselves available in a relationship sexually, that men need to try to make themselves emotionally available in a relationship too. Of because course. It definitely opens up the door to women being more sexual. And I don't know that we get, we talk about that a lot because we try to, I feel like sex is made so separate, right? And for women, it really is all encompassing. And I, and I get for men that it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with having a sexual drive just because you want to have sex. You don't have to be in love. It doesn't have to be love sex every time, right? Correct. And I don't think we talk about that enough either because right. I think, I think the confusion is women always want it to be love sex. 
and it can't always be that. Can I tell you, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but one of the nicest things a woman I was in a serious relationship was, she said to me, she goes, you don't ever have to worry about sex. Anytime you want to have sex, we're having it. No questions asked. So that lowers the stress level. All, all of a sudden, instead of me desiring it all the time, it's like, oh, you know, all right, all right, I check that box. Time. I can get some work done. And I know if I want sex, we're having sex. And she was in that, and she was honest to her word till the, till the relationship was over. Then yeah. of course, you know, yeah, but uh, yeah, it, it changes your whole mindset. It really does. And I will say I've done that in a relationship and it worked out very well. And I felt I could feel him relax so much more about not right. worrying about how do I play up to having sex? What do I have to, I, we had that conversation and I said, listen, I think sex is important. When you want to have sex, we'll have sex. Just make sure that we're both taking care of each other. And I'm, I'm good. I'm right. good to go. And I did. It's the first time I've ever done a relationship. And I highly recommend it. I, I thought it worked out beautifully. I, I remember seeing a uh, Phil Donahue. This is many, many years ago. This couple decided. She said to him, you know what we're going to do? We're going to have sex every single day. We're going to have sex every single day. I remember I was, hearing about this. Right? And they had yeah. sex. And their relationship became amazingly close. Yes. She said, we're good. I don't care if it's oral sex, hand jobs, anal. Even when she's having day. her period though? Whatever, every day. She's, she's, huh. he's having an orgasm every day. That's what her, and they wrote a book about it. I remember, I do remember hearing about this. Well, I have to say, as long as the couple agrees, I think it's really smart because yeah. intimacy just bonds you on so Absolutely. many levels. Right. Absolutely. And then here's the thing with cheating. Cause you know, that's, that's always a part of the conversation. If you're having sex every day with your guy and he's still cheating, cheating has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the other person. And I don't think that's said enough either. Right. Women always worry about the cheating aspect, but here's the thing. If your partner's cheating, you've got to separate yourself from that and recognize it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them. And if you have sex every day with your partner and he's going to cheat, then you have to find a way to rise above that and move on. Like having more sex won't fix him. No. Changing the sex no. life won't fix him. No, you know, I've had girlfriends say that like, oh, I'll just, you know, we'll have crazy sex. I'm like, no, a cheater is a cheater. <laughs> you can't really fix. I don't know that you can fix a cheater. I don't he's know. He's broken. He's got to come to, it's like stopping smoking. You got to come to that realization yourself. Yeah. You got to want to say that my life is better when I'm not cheating. I want to be committed to a, to a woman that's wrong on so many levels. You know, maybe his dad cheated or his mom cheated. Yeah. And he's, it's all some sort of psychological yeah. control thing where I'm, yeah. I got, I got hand if I'm cheating on you, cause then you're always there and you're counting on me and I'm going, you know, I'm not committed. Right. right. And speaking of cheating on Friday. Whoa. I love the transitions. Gonna, we are going to have the author of this book. Can you see it? To, to love, love it. honor and betray. What happened to obey? it betray it's about why women specifically women why women cheat we're going to have the author of this book on friday her name is adrian lopez and this book was on oprah winfrey along with adrian and they were able to discuss along the, the same lines that we were talking about about they really dug into why women cheat how women feel about cheating what what's the long-term repercussions so i'm really excited wow. to talk about this on on friday that's gonna be fun well done yeah yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So as far as like the sex drive, do you feel like as a man that's been in different relationships at different times in your life, the sex drive was more important than other times? Or do you find it equally important because it's a way- Oh, of you're finding get men in my age, it's really starting to become diminished. Like it's not the big driver anymore. Okay. I had lunch with a buddy of mine who's a little bit older than me. He goes, I, you know, my sex drive is almost, almost down to zero. And so along that line, then what, what do they do to, are they interested in bringing that drive back in a relationship or are they just like, eh? Yeah. I think okay. you, I think you like the companionship at some point. I mean, he, okay. he's 16 years older than me. Companionship. Oh, got it. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. That makes he used sense. to be, used to be, he used to be, that was all when he got up in the morning until he went to bed with whoever. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting, Tom, because I, I know in my era, we weren't really taught 
what the sex drive does to men. We weren't really taught that in our heads. We're like, how dare they? How dare they? We really should focus on the biology and the reality of what testosterone do does, right? Because it's, it's a driving force for a, a lot of everything for men get up. They want to, they want to produce, you know, become uh, successful, get money, get position, get power, all to, to feed the sex drive that's driving them every day and right. get out of bed and go, go, go. Yeah, I think we would all be a lot better off if we focused on what it would take to keep that in a healthy element, right? Because it's not a bad thing, but we've made it a bad thing because it's worked against a lot of women because of misunderstandings of like, oh, we went out and we had sex and why is he having sex with someone else? Well, he never told you he wasn't gonna have sex with someone else. Just because right. he had sex with you doesn't mean it was important to him, right? And we right. don't, we don't right. really talk about that. No communication is key yeah well some of us we think we're good and then we find out it's like talking to someone in different language i've i've recognized in my relationships i think i'm being very clear and it comes back to me and i'm like oh no we're not talking the same language at all so i don't know what the secret is what's well, interesting so yes last night we're all at the, at the pool we're all talking about nine of us 12 of us sitting in, and i asked the question I, I i went in a different direction i asked the question yeah. And then somebody said, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, that's blah. That's the question. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's good. I've said it three times. <laughs> exactly the same way all three times. And I was denied that I was even saying what I was saying. I go, you know, so, so people were drinking a little bit. Yeah. But that, it it'd is be like having a conversation with a drunk. You can't, they're not responsible. Yeah. They're not paying attention. They don't understand what you're saying. Yeah. But, you know, you and I have talked about this, about perception, right? Because I'm going to hear something where I'm coming from right now today. And so if I've only had a limited amount of understanding in that area, I wouldn't maybe understand it the same way you do because you're asking the question, you have more right. knowledge. Right. Let me ask you a question. Did you yeah. ever buy a pack of cigarettes and then smoke them? I, my first time buying cigarettes was when I was in college and I wanted to smoke because my roommate smoked. So I bought a carton. Right. I bought a carton you went all and I, in and i i this is how i do i was like i'm i'm gonna smoke big time so i bought the carton i put up on the shelf and i remember thinking i'm in college and i have a carton of cigarettes i, I felt very good up and i didn't like them at all and so i gave them to my roommate so i never smoked again after that i just so how many like did you it. smoke before you decided you didn't like it i think a couple because my roommate said i was smoking wrong i i was trying to do it all on my own because my parents smoked so i assumed i knew how to smoke a cigarette yeah you've been watching it for 30 years 20 years and yeah so i'm like i know how to smoke now i had also i smoked pot at the time too and i think i was confusing the two and just really inhaling yeah you can't inhale uh -huh. yeah so just a couple and then my roommate was thrilled because i bought salem lights and i, I the only reason i bought very ladylike <laughs> it seemed very feminine and that's why I bought them. And my roommate was thrilled because even though cigarettes aren't as weren't as expensive as they are now, I found them to be pricey. Um, so no, why do you ask that question? About well, cigarettes? that was the question I asked the group last night. I said, I'm going to take this conversation in a different direction. It was interesting. The smokers, people hit, I said, I said, okay, there's 12 of us in a circle. I said, don't say anything yet. Yeah. How many people here have bought a pack of cigarettes and smoked them. Okay. So that was the question for the group. Uh -huh. And then we all went, went around and said a number, you know, you say a number and then uh, people were saying 10, 11, nine, eight, five, five. So numbers were all over the place. Oh. And it turned out to be the answer was six. And all the smokers thought we're all giving everybody high numbers and all the not smokers oh. gave low numbers. And yeah. if this is a family. We've known each other for years. So yeah. it was interesting to find out who bought cigarettes and smoked them. My, you know, my dad yeah. smoked, my mom didn't. And I knew my old, we all knew my older brother and older sister smoked, but we didn't know about everybody else, the kids and, you know. I feel like growing up a lot of people, even though smoking was very accepted, there were definitely people I knew in my family that hid that they smoked which I don't know. I never understood that. But one of my aunts would go, don't tell grandma and she'd go around the corner. And I was like, you know, so in my head, smoking was really bad and radical because yeah. it was being hidden. How many cigarettes are there in a pack of cigarettes? 20. I don't know. Are you a cigarette? Have you ever smoked cigarettes? I, Matt Ward and I, Matt stole a cigarette from his dad. We're literally in third grade. 
fourth grade. <laughs> what? One puff, we were done. <laughs> Third grade. I'm out. <laughs> oh, that's I, hilarious. Yeah, I never bought and smoked. Did you ever pee in a pool? I'm sure I must have. I can't. I remember being very worried because I always heard those rumors about that the water would turn more blue around you. So I, I don't believe that I'm a I'm a peeing in the pool person because it makes me nervous. I wouldn't, not that I'm not above it, but I didn't want to get caught doing it. I've never peed in the pool. I always thought it was weird to have those signs. We don't pee, we don't swim in your toilet, don't pee in our pool and stuff like this. I go, who's peeing in a pool? I think a lot of people pee. Everybody, everybody, except for me, has peed in the pool. <laughs> They were all the, oh, they said, shit, we, I peed in your pool, for God's sakes. I go, what? I think a lot of people do. But it's like anything else. Like, I won't pee in the shower. I'll go to use the toilet first. I'll pee in the shower, yeah. And less people pee in the shower, which I find interesting. Okay. So. Hey, I got to get you out of here, baby. It's yeah, 12 I got to go do stuff. So um, thank you for joining us here on this Monday. My name is Melinda McKenzie. I'm Tom Wise. And uh, yeah. we'll see you Wednesday. You've been a packing some shit. That's another one in the can. Thanks. Listen, can you hear the giggling in the back? I've had a ball. All my in-law, all my brothers and sisters. All right. <laughs> see you when I get classes. <laughs>